Excellent. Um, some of you are new to me, so I just want to make a little bit of an intro. Um, I'm Becca Strang. I'm an account executive with First Integrity Title. This is Nikki. She's going to be teaching our class. Hi. Hi. And she's our senior vice president at the company. Um, a few things about First Integrity, if, if we're totally new to you guys. Um, we've been around for 20 years. We're owned by three attorneys. Um, we're the second largest private local owned company. Um, what I like about that is that like we always have one of our owners at our team meetings. And it's just really neat because they're always kind of gauging like what are what are our clients saying? What, what can we dial in more? How can we help? Um, and I like the fact that our vice president is available to teach a title one class. <laughs> um, Thank it's you. Great. Yes. Um, so we have a wealth of knowledge behind us. Um, and one thing I really like to mention is that we have four underwriters, and one of them in particular runs a really great discount. And I know some of you have clients who are really tight on money um, to the point that they're even asking you to negotiate your commission. Um, so anywhere you can save the money helps. And so if you have a property, a listing, that they have refinanced or sold the property and it was insured in the past six years, we'll give it a 30% discount on title to hand. Um, it genuinely saves them a lot of money. It typically is around $800 based on what the average title policy is. Um, so if I can ever run you a title quote real quick, holler my way, back if this is the property address, this is the listing price, always thrilled to run you some numbers, or even get you a full-on seller's net sheet. Um, so it gets even better than that. If the property was sold or refinanced in the past three years, we're going to give it a 50% discount. Um, so that's just through one of our underwriters, and I can always apply that discount um, if, you're, if you're like, hey, back up, by the way, it was refinanced a few years ago. Can we check on this? But we need to know that. Um, or, or you can say, hey, can you just double check and see if this qualifies for any discounts? Wonderful. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit about our company yes. and kind of what my role is as account executive. I know some people are like, what do you guys do? Um, my role is to bring in title orders. So the way that I go about doing that is connecting with realtors and lenders, seeing how I can add value with the idea that when you grow your business and when you have listings, hopefully I'm growing my business too. Um, so that's my mindset all the time is like what kind of education do you need? What kind of resources do you need to support you so that you can go out there and get more business? Um, so one thing I want to mention, one resource is this postcard I passed around, Scenic Drives. Something like this, like I'm not trying to sell you this, if you use me for marketing, does not matter. But if this adds value to you, I'd love to be a resource to you in this. Dawn and Skip just came up with this really great concept for an area that they want to farm. So first of all, when they were like, hey, we want to start farming in this area, we, we really talked about what makes sense of who you should reach. Let's pull that mailing list. Let's get it dialed in so you're not just like throwing marketing dollars at the window, but really what makes sense for who you should reach and how many and how often can you get them in a way that you can afford. So that's the kind of things we discuss. Um, my background in the company was I started in the marketing department doing flyers like this. So if, if this adds value to you, like marketing, farming, would love to chat with you about it. If not, I know, hi, welcome, come in. Um, for a lot of you, you're just like, hey, I just want a title rep who's going to answer the phone when I call. I want a title rep who can really quickly give me a seller's net sheet on the flyer and O&E. So I'd love to hear what adds value to you and be a resource to you in title land. Um, so let me know how I can help. Um, also, with Scenic Drives, in general, I have a battle plan of month to month what you would be sending out. So if marketing is something you're interested in, just say, hey, Becca, I want to know what I can be sending out month to month just so I can keep it on the radar. So keep me posted. Um, like I said, Dawn and Skip did one where it was an agent intro piece. So we customized something just for them, something that really was in, in line with their farming efforts. So keep those things in mind. And um, I'm going to go ahead and also center on this binder just so you have an idea of kind of what marketing we can do. Um, and so just kind of quietly flip through. And if you have any questions on this, um, I'm going to shoot everybody an email after class. And you can say, hey, Becca, by the way, I want to get the Scenic Drives postcard set up. What do you need from me? So let me know how I can help. Um, I will go ahead and pass this around. And we'll also get a sign-in sheet going just so I can send you some resources after class. Um, Stacy, where is Stacy actually? <laughs> Can we get a, a paper or sign-in sheet? Yeah, of course. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, and also with that sign-in sheet, if you are interested, we have a seller's net sheet, uh, or sorry, a seller's a seller's net sheet app right now. And the seller's net sheet app not only produces seller's net sheets, but it has calculators that can show monthly affordability. So if you have somebody who's like, I only want to spend 400 dollars in a house, but they don't even quite understand, you know what, if you make it 415, it only is going to affect your monthly affordability by X, Y, and Z. So this app that we have doesn't just do these quick sellers net sheets that has title fees and taxes. 
It also has like 10 different calculators in there and really great marketing. Now, the marketing I want to mention because they just came out with this great new flyer that has iBuyer versus Realtor costs. It is so cool because it, what it shows is that iBuyers are like, hey, we don't have commission fees. Okay, yeah, but they have so many other fees that genuinely equate even more than your commission. So we have this really great new fly in there that's iBuyer versus Realtor costs. And something like that, we have a variety of them, and it only costs $1 a month for it, for you to access it and be customized with your information. So if you're interested in that app, I just need your phone number, and I'll shoot you a link. Simple as that. Um, but thanks for having us. I'm going to let um, Nikki get going on Title 101 and read through the title commitment. I encourage you to ask questions. If you've seen things that you're like, hey, this thing happened on a title situation, I've always wondered about it bring it up. She has seen so many things. I encourage you to kind of bring it up so that we can all benefit from whatever experience you've had. Um, but it's it's great to see you guys. I'm going to let you get going. And thanks for having us. Does anybody else have water? <laughs> oh, and for anyone who just walked in, there are egg souffles in the kitchen. So grab an egg souffle, meet it, and then, and then come get settled in. for First Integrity, so I oversee the title and the escrow operations. Uh, thank you, Paul. Okay, awesome. Um, so my background is that I started out at a very like small boutique title company, kind of doing everything that was title, escrow, accounting related. So I got the opportunity to kind of dig into every facet of a small company and parlay that into sort of building a larger company in all of its different divisions. Um, so I definitely have not seen everything, but I have seen a lot. Um, and as Becca said, we set time at the end of this for Q&A, but I would encourage you to just eat up that time throughout the class. Um, I think that as we hit on individual topics where you either have specific questions or something that happened to you, that storytelling is kind of where we get the most out of these classes. Um, so I'd rather we didn't finish, but we really got into the meat of some good stuff if that's where the class goes. Um, I would also tell you that the, the presentation is very text heavy, and I've done that purposefully because I don't know if this ever happened to you guys, but I will want to drill back into something that I learned in a class and I'll go back to the presentation deck and all I have is like pictures and like a sentence that doesn't really tell me anything. <laughs> so the text is really heavy. You don't feel like you have to read it as I'm talking, but we built it as a resource tool for you after the fact. And even in some cases can operate as like a script almost if you are being asked certain questions um, by your clients. So we'll send this to everybody after class. Yep, oh, yeah, that's kind of, we designed it to be sort of a tool for you after the fact. Um, and then um, last but not least, I would say that my class may be just a little bit different than probably some of the other Title I one classes that I've seen and even the Title I one class I used to do and that I think that we tend to jump right into how to read a title commitment. And I like to kind of take it two steps back and give you some like core principles and some building blocks that are about title and how title works and public records so that we have something to build on by the time we get to commitments. It gives us a lot more context. Um, then I think just jumping right into how to read it. So that's kind of where we'll start. Um, I know Becca asked, but um, I'd be interested to know kind of what is the experience level of everyone in this room? Like who has done under five transactions? Okay, who has done maybe more than 20? Okay, and who's done more than 100? All right. Okay, good. Well, so we have a good variety. How about more than eight? <laughs> <laughs> I did not count. <laughs> I put you in the more than 100 category yeah. at that level. Um, but that's a good mix of experience level for us to build off of, which is good. So one of the first things I like to do is really kind of dig into what you guys are doing every day. Um, and you know why we come to this table to teach, and that's about you know ownership. You're helping buyers and sellers transfer ownership to property or obtain ownership. So I want to kind of put some context around what ownership really is. Um, 
So I think we know what an owner is and we feel like our people do, but again, I wanna put a definition around it that gives us some context to apply to other principles. And ownership or a right of ownership is really kind of what I would call like the whole enchilada of rights, right? As an owner, um, you have ownership rights that allow you a right to use, a right to possess, a right to enjoy, and a right to convey. Um, so you have all the rights that you can do anything with. You can give all those rights that you also have to other people, um, as opposed to different types of interests where you are limited in real property and what you can do. Sorry. Um, that's all right. Um, so, um, so think of ownership as kind of having everything. And so how do you obtain ownership? You obtain ownership through you know, a few different methods, but the most common that we see are these listed right here. So the first one is the one that you guys are doing all the time, and that's deeds, right? That's a voluntary transfer of title from one person to another via some sort of conveyance document, typically a deed. Um, the other that we see is in court actions. So if you have been doing this a long time, um, or maybe you haven't been doing it a long time, but you've still sort of heard the term quiet title action, which is like the thing we hope to never see. Um, quiet title actions are court actions where you know there might be some um, dispute or some ambiguity over who owns a piece of property and we go into the courts and we ask the court to make a decision about who owns property. Um, so that's an example of like a court action that would actually transfer title or make a decision about who owns title. Um, and then the third is laws. Um, there are laws that can vest title or transfer title just by simply operation of law. So probably the most common that everybody knows is um, in the event of a death, when you own title with a, as a joint tenant with someone and one of those people passes away by operation of law, title will pass upon the death of the other joint tenant. So those are kind of the three ways that you acquire ownership. Um, and the reason I think that those are important is because we're going to talk about them in the context of sort of all the other ownership rights that we see and those owner ownership rights and how they affect title. Um, so, you know, all of those documents that we talked about, whether they're court orders, whether they're deeds transferring title, they all go of public record. Everything goes of public record here in the county court record system so that anyone can see who has rights and interest in property. Um, so that's important because that's how we do our research. That's how we know who owns property and what sort of other interests are there. So we have ownership rights and we've talked about that. So I want to talk about the other type of rights that we are used to seeing out there of record. So you have kind of a whole variety of different interests and these are kind of the most common that we're used to seeing. Um, you can have easement rights where easement rights are typically an agreement where you two people or a hundred people have decided that there's some beneficial use in using each other's property and so they'll come up with agreements that set out terms of how they can use that property. Um, these are typically things for like utilities, right? Public service is going to have an easement on the rear 10 feet of a property in order to access their utility lines. Um, you might have things like shared driveway agreements where you have to cross one person's property in order to get to another. Um, typically when it comes to easements, you have what's called the benefited and burdened parties. So if you and I own property next to each other and I have to travel across yours to get to mine, I'm the benefited property because I'm benefiting from the easement and you would be the burdened property because you're burdened by it. Um, Leases, uh, when we think of leases, I think we think of tenants. It's actually fairly uncommon in Colorado to record leases for tenants, but it does happen. Um, but we also have like oil and gas leases, things like that, right? So there's like a determined amount of time in which someone might have a right to the property that might right be to possess, or it might just be to use it in some other form. Um, we have covenants. Covenants, we typically attach the word covenant to HOA, and that's a good way to attach it, but there can also be covenants that are one-page documents between two owners next to each other. But covenants are, covenant is another word for agreement. Just means there's been an agreement between parties, and that might mean an agreement between 600 people. That might be an agreement just between two. Um, and then you have liens. Liens typically are, an, a, you know, they are something that's recorded against real property in order to recover a monetary value. And we kind of put those in two boxes typically, right? We have voluntary and involuntary, and they're pretty much what they sound like. A voluntary lien is a lien that I give someone voluntarily. I say, in order to repay a debt, 
I am voluntarily giving you an interest in my property as collateral. So you guys typically see that at your closings in the form of a deed of trust because the bank is giving a mortgage on the property. Um, but involuntary liens are the type of thing where, for example, maybe your seller has a credit card debt and that credit card company went out and obtained a judgment. Um, under the law, if they follow certain steps and record that judgment in their own property records, they can secure their lien against the real property. And that would be an example of an involuntary lien. They didn't give that lien, um, but the creditor took some steps to actually place it as a lien. So those can be the like surprise. You didn't know you had this on your house, maybe when you get to closing. Um, <clears throat> so those about, are all kind of... I have a question. Yeah. About the lien thing you were saying mm -hmm. about. Uh, the HOA is the involuntary, correct? There's a lien on your property by the HOA. And an HOA time. lien, I think I would consider... That's an interesting question. I think I would consider an HOA a voluntary lien. And the reason that I would is because when you choose to buy, you choose to come into a homeowners association. And the terms of that association is something that you agree to. So... I would look at that not necessarily as though you're giving someone a lien, but by virtue of coming into the association, you accept the terms of the covenants, and the terms of the covenants would relate to a lien for assessment. So I would, I would, but I'm not, I'm not sure. It's, it's probably a bit of a blurry line because you're not like a lien from an HOA is technically goes in place from the minute a covenant is recorded. But they're trickier to find, aren't they? The HOA yes. liens as well. Yeah, but so that's where like when you come into a HOA, technically the lien is established from recording of the covenant. Yeah. So HOAs will go out of their way when someone owes them a debt to actually record a second lien sometimes and say like, oh, we've gotten, you know, some are spot on, they're a month late, they record a lien, others will wait a year. Yeah. But that's not actually when the lien is established. The lien rights are established by the recording of the covenant, which say we have the right to collect assessments and we have the right to lien property in exchange for those assessments. So again, I would say sort of when you buy a piece of property, I would say you buy a piece of property and you sort of agree to those things that affect it or that come yeah. subject to it. And we'll dive a little bit more into, into that concept, I think a little bit later in the class, but I would say you agree and accept those terms just like you agree that you're not gonna paint your house purple if that's what the covenants say. Um, so I would consider that voluntary. You don't have to necessarily buy that house. In the case of an involuntary lien, like I described with a judgment creditor, it's a debt that's totally unrelated to your real yeah. property, right? But the, that actual creditor chose to take certain steps to collateralize property that you may or may not own. They actually, in some cases, don't even know that you own it. They just go out and record in case you do. Yeah. Or in case you acquire an interest in real property and they want to attach to it. So that's why I would throw it in the voluntary lien box because you're still sort of making a choice to incur that debt and that lien from the time that you purchase. Is that why they're so lax about recording some of it because it's part of the covenant and they're like, well, we're going to get our money anyway. So yes and no. Matter. I mean, they think they will get their money yeah. anyways to a degree, but there are there's actually a whole separate law that determines how HOAs can collect their assessments. Yeah. Um, called Kiowa, and yeah. um, there are certain protections put in place for homeowners associations to make sure that um, they cannot get wiped out in the event of a foreclosure and things like that, right? Because if HOAs don't get paid, you know, you have to think about HOAs and the fact that those dues are intended to maintain huge spaces and developments, right, that might affect value of entire subdivisions yeah. if they can't maintain and operate. And so uh, there are some protections put in place for them to say, you know, you will always get a certain amount of money, and it's called a super lien. And then they have some dues that are considered subordinate liens that can get wiped out. So they're kind of a special case in that their lien can actually split into two different types of liens um, if they get to a point where they're trying to collect it. But certainly in a good market, I think that concept of we'll get our dues is there because, you know, they know a person's going to sell or they're going to refi, they're going to do those things, and then they're going to have to get paid. So yeah. the only time yeah. they can get some of their dues wiped out is in the event of a foreclosure, and then they'll only get partial dues wiped out. Oh, so interesting. Okay. Yeah. So and that like that could be a whole other class or, um, on HOAs and foreclosure and how liens are established from a priority sense in foreclosure. Yeah, because usually dealing with the bank then anyway, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I think that is a great segue into sort of the next part, right? So. 
we we are basically saying that there are some types of liens so we talked about how there's recording right a public record so any interest that's in real property should go public record so that the world is on notice that it exists whether that be an ownership interest an easement interest a lease interest a covenant um, any of those things go public record so that we can research them and we can see them but also because it establishes a right of ownership or it establishes a lien priority so you know that's a fancy way of saying order of recording counts um, we're called a race state because it's a race to the clerk and recorder's office if you give me a deed for property today and you give her a deed for property today but i beat you to the clerk and recorder with my deed i own it um, and so that actually established the recording process is very important when it comes to timing and from a lien standpoint liens are given a priority of recording meaning who gets there first is gets first dibs at the value or the money in the property right so that's really important to a lender if they're giving a loan for a large mortgage they want to make sure they're in a first lien position above any other liens in the event they need to foreclose um, there are certain types of liens that have laws around them that establish their priority outside of recording so regardless of when they actually make it to the clerk and recorder, the law says their position is in a certain place. So these are some examples of those mechanics liens. If you've ever dealt with a property that's got construction going on, you'll find title companies are really squeamish about that. We're going to ask you for all sorts of stuff that you and your client won't like and you know we'll probably be bugging you about it, but it's because mechanics liens present so much risk for us. Their um, lien position does not relate to when they record, it relates to when they began work, which is of course something we can't see. So um, in states like California, when a contractor goes to work, they put something of record immediately saying, hey, just so the world knows I'm on the job. And that tells everyone, but in Colorado, that's not required. So we, not, we don't know if construction is going on unless maybe somebody informs us or tells us. So the minute we do, we start asking questions about whether work is done, whether it's been paid for, because it's an unforeseen some, something that can take priority over new liens and new ownership. So if you are an owner of a property, just to kind of draw that out, if you are an owner of a property and you get construction work done and you don't pay the contractor for work and then you sell to her, you're technically your contractor has a right that is above yours as the new owner and he could foreclose that lien and foreclose your interest out so that would be a huge risk to a title company so that's why we dig into those so yeah. i have another question about mechanics mm -hmm. say you have your basement finished something like that yes. you're like almost through your basement but the contract is really messing up and you've lost your patience and you said to him okay i'm just going to pay you for you you tell me what i mean you pay him mm -hmm. and he goes away mm -hmm. then you find out when you go to sell your property that the electrician or something has put a lien on your property mm -hmm. and you didn't know because you've paid him. What is the process to get that removed? Um, well, it's a great question. Know that when you pay a general contractor, all of their subs still have a lien right to your property. So just because you pay the general contractor, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean you don't own the subs. So it's incredibly risky and a reason why people should vet out the GCs that are on their project and they should make sure that those subs are getting paid even if that means they pay them themselves. So, you know, you hire a GC, GC hires an electrical, you should make sure that that electrician is getting paid and that you're seeing proof of that. But if they don't get paid, your process to clear it up would be that you would have to take the GC to court and sue them. But are you within your right if they're subcontracting to plumbers or electricians, are you within your right to approach that electrician directly and say, I would like a, just a receipt to show that you have been paid? Oh, definitely. I mean, they worked on your house, right? And so, yes. And you have the right to ask the GC for that. The GC can sometimes provide to you proof that they're paying those subs as the project moves along. Um, so a great example of that is that's what a bank does, right? When a bank is financing construction, they make sure they monitor every draw that they issue and they make sure that they get a schedule of completion and that everything that's done that those subs have been paid. So that's how they do that without extending more money and extending more money and extending more money. So if you're GC, you've paid him, he's given you a receipt saying everything's being paid for, that because he obviously subbed to the other contractors, yeah. that doesn't cover you? You can't no. just take the GC's paperwork that he's no, he's but I would say a lot of contractors. But a lot of people him. do, right? So you should vet a GC. You should get their resume. You should get their experience level, and you should get recommendations. And I think that's the best thing that you can do. So when I say it isn't good enough, I think you'll you would find 
you know, that it would be a challenge to push any GC to, they want to manage their subs and they want to pay them. Yeah, they don't want so, you knowing them. Yeah, I mean, they, they, yeah, they might not want they're you like, knowing, but you can get lien it. waivers. So even if you don't get proof of payment, you can get lien waivers from the subs as they come in and out of the project. And is that so, something you draw up or you have something drawn up by somebody else? You can just and pull it up just... online. Title companies typically got lien waivers that they can hand to you that you just kind of fill in the blanks that are like, I'm so-and-so and I've completed my work and I've been paid for all of my work to do. Yeah, it's useful to know if you've got a client finishing in a basement yeah that they should get that sign yeah. off you know. i mean most people you know that like i say the best thing that i think you can do if i was giving advice to someone would be vet your gcs right <laughs> i well, mean you can you bet them but you don't know i mean it could take nine months to finish your job and then six months in they're getting a divorce with his wife and she's taking for him and he's got no money his assets are for sure. you don't know life happens so sure but if that's I mean, his career your client right but if that's things. his career and he works on a referral basis typically you know it's one of the best things you can do to vet out because like you say you can never know for sure right and so yeah but, i think that that yeah. experience level and that resume is the best thing that you can do when approaching sort of who you're going to have come finish your base yeah for. but it's good to know that you have some documentation mm -hmm. for for them yeah. to sign up and it's online, online. i mean you could pull up a lean waiver yeah. on google and come up with it it's a pretty simple form that just says i've been paid for all my work to date but is it applicable in colorado mm -hmm. you know yeah. what i mean if you just yeah. want to make sure yep absolutely and like if you, it, our forms are our forms so i mean they're definitely more like title company geared because they're geared for our protection when we're getting them but they'd certainly do the trick okay yeah. all right good to know all right, so seller financing is another one that takes um, lien priority. So there's laws out there that say, you know, if kids are buying their house from mom and dad and mom and dad are loaning them a little bit of money and then the bank is also loaning them money, um, there are laws out there that say that that money from mom and dad goes in first position before any other loan. Mm -hmm. So um, we can do some paperwork because, of course, lenders don't like that. They want to be in first position, especially if they're loaning bulk of the money. So we do some paperwork to just acknowledge that mom and dad know that they're going to go in second position behind that loan. Um, but it's a good thing to know because you shouldn't be surprised if your title company says to you, great, you're going to do some seller financing. We're going to ask you some additional paperwork to do what we call subordinating that second loan to the first. Um, and then HOA liens, which we've talked about. So that's a little bit we already dove into sort of super lien and there, there are laws out there that establish that certain HOA liens have a priority over all other liens, including mortgages to some degree. So, um, and then of course you have things like taxes, right? Like property taxes are right up there above everybody else. Right. So, um, but those are some examples of the things where laws dictate priority and that recording order. But recording order, again, is a very important because that's how we establish who owns, wait, wait, the way title passes, what we call a chain of title, the way different rights are given, whether they be easement rights, covenant rights, whatever they are, everything rolls off of when it records and that it records. Um, so you'll find clients who maybe did a quick claim deed with people two years ago that they're like holding on to and they've never recorded. Um, to record it now would potentially be problematic, right? Especially people sometimes do that a lot with like estate planning. So they'll be like, we got this deed from mom, you know, like a ways back and we've been holding on to it so that if something happens to her, we can record it. And we're like, man, that, that might present some issues, right? So that's maybe not the best way to go about that, but that's kind of what people do. So best when you have a conveyance document or something giving a right that it goes to public record to tell the world that. And if you're not ready to put it a public record to actually make it happen, there's some other ways that you might be able to go about that and we can help you with some of that if you have questions, so. Um, so, yeah, so now let's get into, now that we kind of have the background of different rights and interests and how they go with public record, let's talk about what we do when we get your guys' contracts. So we go into research mode, right? We start looking at those county court records. Um, we start looking at a whole bunch of different databases. So every title company has probably some variety of different search and examination standards. Most of us um, certainly, if you're up of a certain size, you have some standardized examination and search rules that we all sort of um, live by. We don't search every piece of property all the way back to its inception or its patent, right? If we did, everyone would wait 15 days to get title work, which we know nobody wants to do. So uh, we have some uh, shortcuts that we employ that have, give us a comfort level that this is a good stop for us to stop looking at records. Um, and then, of course, you know, with time and experience, we build databases and internal backgrounds for certain subdivisions that allow us to sort of hit a stopping point and we're not searching everything all the way back. 
Um, but we had other databases too, right? So I say a good title company, if you're doing a resale transaction, you're also looking at county mapping information where it's available. You know, we're trying to see what's the property look like? Where's the house sitting in relation to the boundary lines in a general sense? You know, do the improvements all look like they're within the property? Are we abutting a public road um, for access reasons? Um, you know, if we're looking at a larger property, does it look like someone's driving across the back uh, that may be an unestablished easement? You know, those are all parts of us painting a big picture about what's going on with the property. Um, I think this is a really interesting statistic that, I mean, I, I do think surprises people, but more than a third of all title searches reveal a problem in the chain of title. So, I mean, one out of every three files has an issue, right? So, um, this what's is... What's the most popular issue? Oh... I don't know that there's one most popular, but I would say that probably the thing we run into the most is really errors. It's typographical errors, right? It's things like um, a party name being incorrect, a legal description being incorrect. And then I would put that right up there with um, liens that have been paid off but are not properly released. So those are typically yeah. what I would call defects in the chain that are things that might cause us to have to do some sort of cleanup when we get to closing a new transaction. Um, so, you know, just general sort of errors and omissions. It's actually really rare that you find really substantial defects in title because usually it's clear the intent of the parties to do something. It's just that something may have gone awry, um, but they happen and that's why, you know, we do our jobs. I mean, I think I've got some, you know, I can remember, you know, a house that we searched in Pueblo that, you know, we discovered was sitting you know, literally on the boundary line of the property, half on one lot and half on the actual lot that it was owned. And it had been that way since the time it was built because the building restrictions were really lax during that time. And, you know, we were like, wow, this can't be right, but it was. Um, and so, you know, you can have those huge defects, which are problems and big things. Um, but a lot of the time what we're doing is, you know, intent of the parties was clear, but it didn't happen the way it was supposed to. or people do bad things on their own when they start filling out deeds and recording them and then you know things get kind of off track or you have previous transactions where things get paid off and just not released and then it's actually really challenging to try to go back and track down that information when it may have happened 10 years ago or, or something along those lines and that's usually where we engage with you and ask you to engage with your clients where you have things like that you know we need help when it comes to stuff like that and we need to start talking to sellers and say what happened around this time period? How did this get paid off? You know, things like that. And then, you know, we start doing some other digging to try to get it cleared up. But those are probably the most common. Um, this is always a great part for me to make the distinction that, um, you know, we are operating as an insurance and an escrow company. And so when we prepare title products like commitments for you guys, that is not what we would consider an abstractive title. It means it's not a report of anything that's ever affected title. It's our terms of coverage, right? So there's a lot of this little stuff that we might find in our search and decide it's really immaterial. It doesn't affect the insurance coverage. We're not worried about, we're gonna move on and not do anything about it. You know, a small typographical error in a name or something like that, or maybe there's an omission in the deed, right? Like a deed needs a number of components for it to be valid under law, right? You gotta have a signature, you gotta have a notary, you gotta have a legal description. Some of those components can be missing and over certain periods of time, you know, if we have a missing notary acknowledgement that's over 10 years old, we pass on that. We say good enough, um, you know, and there are some laws that help us rely on doing that and other times it's just what we feel good about from a risk standpoint. And that's a lot of what we're doing behind the scenes is making risk determinations about insurance coverage, right? Just like any other insurance product that's out there. They are looking at their risk um, and their claims risk that they might have and what that claims risk looks like for them. So as we run into those problems, we say, is this one that's material to us correcting or is this one that we can move past? So sometimes we'll get calls you know, much later about something and another title company will find an issue that they decide to raise and they'll say, well, we bought this three years ago and that title company didn't raise it. We are making independent decisions about risk. And so a lot of times in those cases, people can feel like, well, we should have cleared that up so it didn't become a problem for them later. But as you know, that's a bit of a double-edged sword. Sometimes we can make people clean something up that they don't think is that big of a deal. And so if we don't think it's a big deal and doesn't carry claim risk, we'll try our best to move past it as long as we don't really believe it will create a problem for people down the road. 
Um, so I like to just sort of call that out and say it's not a report of anything and everything that ever happened. It, it really is insurance coverage at the end of the day, and we decide what risk is acceptable under that insurance coverage. And I think that risk is, for us, also we try to do the best thing for the consumer, right? If we notice a problem, even if we don't think it presents claims risk to us, if we know that, for example, there's an issue, and even though I don't think there's any claim that I can ever obtain, but I know the county assessor is not going to like the way they transfer title, and that that's going to be a problem for this person getting tax bills, we'll say, let's clean that up, because we know we're going to get calls about that after the fact, claim or not, and we want to do a good service in making sure that someone's got clean title with the problems after the fact. Um, but anyways, all that research that we're doing is so that we can get to compiling, compiling a title commitment um, for the clients that contains requirements of all the items that need to be cleared and exceptions for all the things that a property comes with that can't be cleared or that we don't think is likely to be cleared. So all that research that we're doing is so we can paint a picture for everyone of based on what the buyer wants to buy, these are all the interests in the property that we need to get rid of, old lien rights, curative matters like an error in a deed that we need to clean up any of that and then we have exceptions or exclusions from coverage and we say we're not clearing that up the property comes with that right so that's the picture we're trying to paint so if we talk about what we're doing on a commitment we're we're basically committing to give typically two types of insurance policies that you guys are most familiar with there are others um, but these are the, the ones you're most used to. So the first is the owner's title policy that a purchaser is getting. So it's a policy issued to a purchaser, and it's there to help protect them against a number of things. Um, we've kind of called out here some of those kind of bigger things that tend to get happened or we say, when someone says, what's the point of title insurance? And we say, um, these are some of the things that we feel like we're out there protecting against that resonate with people, right? So errors and omissions and deeds, which we've talked about a little bit forgery um, or even misrepresentation, right? You go under contract with someone, well, I mean, at its most basic level, it's important to make sure that person actually owns the right to sell that to you, right? So we are saying, yes, the person that you went under contract with has a right to give you that piece of property. They have those ownership rights to convey. Um, but also that the person that comes to the table and executes those documents for us is the right person. Bless you. Um, that they're the right person. So we go through that vetting to make sure that the person that's signing those documents is the right person and protect against that. Um, mistakes in examining records. Um, you know, there can just be a past transaction where something entirely got missed by an examiner. Um, when they were searching the public records, they missed a lien or thought it was released and it wasn't, and so now it's still hanging out there. Um, so again, you kind of get that check and balance of, you know, the fact that what you're getting is what you thought you were getting when it comes to what liens and rights affect the property. Um, undisclosed errors is a big one. Um, certainly when someone passes, we go through a process of, depending on how they own property, you go through a process of vetting, you know, do we go down road A, do we go down road B or road C, and some of those involve quick things like recording a death certificate because we have joint tenants and others involve probate where we're trying to see who has an actual interest in this property and who's got the right to convey it out of the estate's interest. Um, and so, you know, you get sort of protected from someone showing up later and saying, hey, wait, there's me, I'm a kid, and I didn't, I didn't get my interest in that property, and so now I'm making a claim for it. Um, owner's policies amounts are typically issued in the amount that you pay for it. So a big component to insurance policies is that protecting you against financial loss. Right? It's not necessarily protect, you know, protecting every facet of use and enjoyment of a property, but it's protecting you against financial loss as it relates to a number of items. So typically your investment in the property is the amount of insurance. Um, and it's a one-time fee that gets paid at closing and is pretty minimal compared to a lot of the other things that you pay. And certainly for insurance coverages, most insurance coverages are designed where you keep on paying premiums whether you have a problem or you don't ever have a problem. But for us, it's a one-time fee. And the reason for that is that, kind of what we talked about earlier, we don't typically see these huge defects in title. If we do our jobs well, we can do it right. So we're not, we're not necessarily insuring for some unforeseen future event that we have no control over, like medical insurance or car accident or whatever. If we hopefully do our jobs good and nobody misrepresents everything at the table and we're all talking and we're above board, our claims risk is really low. Um, so um, the other thing that I would tell you about it is that when we talk about sort of what it defends you against with financial loss is that 
the insurer also would step in for you in a defense capacity if it was appropriate and covered under the policy. So to the extent that you had someone that was suing you over a right of ownership and it was a valid claim under the policy, the insurer would step in and provide legal defense in that way for you, right? So it's not like your client is gonna go and put out thousands of dollars in legal defense and then, and then make a claim. And in fact, one of the things I like to point out when we're in these settings is that in the event you ever have a client that's there, your first call should be to the title insurer. Uh, we have things under the policy which are called a right of remedy, meaning that we have the right to decide the course of action that gets taken in order to fix a claim. Um, what we don't want is people that don't understand that there might be five ways to approach cleaning that up and one includes very minimal cost and is painless. Um, and then one is calling lawyers and spending $20,000 in legal costs, right? If you approach us once you've spent $20,000 in legal costs and we say, we didn't think you needed to do that. So unfortunately, we're not gonna reimburse those costs. Um, you have to give us the opportunity to vet out what the proper solution is and take instruction from the insurer about what next steps to take. Um, but they do that because this is their level of expertise. It's what they do every day, right? When they have claims, they navigate those claims and figure out the best, the quickest, and the most cost efficient way to resolve them. Um, and because most people are, you know, again, acting above board, when you do have even huge title issues, usually you'll find people are pretty cooperative in helping getting them fixed. So we try to make sure that we don't make mountains out of molehills by stepping in at the right time. So it's always important if you get that post closing with a client that you say, you know, file a title claim. Let's figure out what the title company says about what they're going to do here, whether it's a covered matter, period before you start calling anybody else. Um, so I go over the lender's policy because of course you have clients, if they're purchasers, a lot of them that are paying for lender's insurance. So we talked about a lot of the things that are protected under an owner's policy. Um, if we take ourselves a few steps back and we talk about what's protected under the loan policy, um, we talked about that recording order and how important that is to anyone who's trying to recover m a monetary value from property. So really, one of the biggest things we're giving a lender is saying, we're gonna ensure that you're in the lean position you wanna be in. So you're first to get your money, second to get your money, third to get your money, whatever that is. But also that their lien is valid and something that they can perfect or foreclose. So it means that if there are five people in title, we made sure all five people signed that voluntary lien because they'll have a problem foreclosing if they didn't. So we make sure that the legal description's right on it so they can foreclose it. So it's about the validity of the lien that they're creating and the position that they are trying to be in. That's really what we're insuring to a lender. Um, it's usually minimal cost when it's coming with an owner's policy because you know a lot of the research that is done for the policies affects both. Um, so it's looked at as shared risk across the policies. Um, so usually, um, you know, pretty minimal cost. The reason I throw in the part about refinancing, um, even though, you know, I know, you know, you guys aren't necessarily doing refinances for people because I think as realtors, you get calls about everything when somebody owns a home. And so I think that they could call you two years later and say, I'm refinancing and I don't understand why I have to pay for title insurance again when I paid for it when I bought this house. So we just kind of tell you that that's done because um, they're getting a new lien with a new lender that's going to establish a new lien position for new money. And so they pay for it again. Um, at that point. So um, so any questions about any of that before we kind of take all of those building blocks and put them into what we're looking at in title commitments? Okay. Um, all right, so title commitments, you've got three main schedules to a title commitment, and that is Schedule A, which is always laying out your terms of coverage, who's being insured and what's being insured. Then you have Schedule B1, which is laying out requirements. So requirements are those things we talked about where we need to clear them. There are issues that we need to clear up. There are liens we need to pay off. There are all the things we need to do in order to get the transaction to the table and actually close it. Um, requirements are a lot of times dictated by what you guys lay out in the contract. For example, a buyer wants to buy a property and they don't want seller's loan on it when they do it, right? So sometimes that's instruction you guys are giving to us. Um, other times it's things that we're determining need to be cleared up. So it's kind of a whole variety. Then you have Schedule B2. Schedule B2 is all the exclusions from coverage or the exceptions. And that are those are the things that we don't intend to clear that the property is coming with. Um, so we'll dive into each schedule on its own, but those are the three main ones that you're getting. So if we look at Schedule A, um, you're always going to have sort of right up top an effective date. 
Effective date can be confusing for people because they can say, why is this dated two weeks ago? Um, and the reason it's dated two weeks ago is because that's not the date that we're publishing the documents. That is the date that we can see the county records through. So when we talk about that public recording system, if you go walk into Denver County Clerk and Recorder today and you ask them to record a document, I can't see that document today as a title company doing research, right? So there might be anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, depending on how quickly that county publishes records and certifies them for the world to look at. Um, I could go down to the county courthouse probably and pull very up-to-date records, but that's just not you know normal course of business for us if we want to operate quickly and on short time frames. So we typically use online databases for those records and it takes time for those to all get updated and work. Um, so um, that gap, as you can imagine, in records that we just can't see is a huge risk factor for title companies, right? So um, you're under contract to buy a property and I've gone ahead and so you're going to close in three days, but you go and you give a deed to her today, I can't see that. I could proceed with a closing to you two days later and never know that you deeded it to her because we just can't see it, right? So. We'll talk about some of some of the things we do to protect ourselves, but it's just important to remember that that's the day of the records that we search through when we publish that commitment. So it's certainly if you know something that's happened recently, it's important that you're cluing in the title company to something that may not be revealed here if it looks like that. Um, then we kind of go through what policies we're issuing, the amounts of coverage, who we're insuring, and the premiums. So you're typically going to see, you know, anywhere from one to three items listed under Section 2 that are really talking about your amount of coverage, which again, on an owner's policy, you're going to have the proposed insured, which is the buyer. Um, we're getting that from your contract information. Um, you're going to have the amount of coverage, which is typically that purchase price, and then you're going to have the premium allocated for the cost. Um, so, you know, premium, one of the things Becca talked about, you know, there's kind of basic premiums. Premiums are all filed by underwriters with the state, so they're not subject to negotiation in the state of Colorado. They are filed and what they are is what they are. There are discounts that are available based on prior insurance coverage in the chain and things like that. So you have what we call basic premiums and then discounts off of those basic premiums. Um, but they are all filed here. Um, and then like you can see sort of like cost of owner's premium versus cost of lender's policy. Lender's policy is usually substantially less because it's being issued in conjunction with an owner's policy. Um, and then you get into endorsements. So endorsements are what I would like to, what I typically describe as like, if your policy is a bowl of vanilla ice cream, endorsements are like toppings on it, right? They're all the extra coverages. <laughs> um, they're like, you know, all the stuff that you might want, you might not need, but you want, some of them you actually need. Um, when it comes to owner's policies, we typically see one endorsement all the time, and that's owner's extended coverage. Um, it's dictated by Section 8 of your contract, and unless the new July contract change anything, I think it's Section 813 um, that dictates that whether or not you're asking for owner's extended coverage within your policy and who's paying for it. Um, so I think it's a shall, shall not box. Um, and I will tell you that for me, and I would say, you know, kind of standard protocol for us is that we're going to assume everybody wants owner's extended coverage and we'll get into what owner's extended coverage gives you but you know it's a lot it gives you a lot um, and one thing I like to warn people of when we're in these classes is that um, remember that title companies are not a party to your contracts so even though buyers and sellers might agree to give owners extended coverage your title company has not agreed until they issue you a commitment so if you have a reputable title company that you work with and we read your contracts and we know what it is you want, we should be great at getting out there with you if we see an issue and being able to issue that endorsement to you and talk to you about it. Um, but if you're potentially on the buy side of something and you're working with a title company you don't know, I would say it's very important that this is something you review, right? If you and your clients have asked for owner's extended coverage, you have not committed the title company to issuing it by giving them a contract because they don't execute that contract. The only thing that commits them to issuing this is putting it right here on their commitment, on their promise to insure to you. And then you have to meet the requirements required in order to get it. So it's just one of those things that I have certainly seen some title companies over the year that their philosophy has been 
ooh, I'm kind of, I'm not sure I want to issue that coverage because there might be some risk factor. So I'm just going to leave it off the title commitment and see if anybody notices. And they're relying on the fact that, you know, some people don't read it or don't know what they're looking at to know that they didn't include it. Um, so I just say, make sure it's there, right? And if it's not there, engage with your title company and ask why it isn't there and start talking with them about what you need to do to get it. Um, the other endorsements are typically going to be lender endorsements. Lenders like all sorts of toppings on their ice cream. Um, and they kind of have like a standard list that they go to. So even sometimes if we don't know who the lender is, we tend to just include some stock endorsements that we know we're going to get asked for. Hey, Nikki, what mm -hmm. do you suggest if like, I, I feel like people in here, if their client were like, hey, if, uh, they wouldn't know about endorsements. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest realtors do if their client is like looking for extra protection or gets a title fit and back and they're like, well, I don't like this uh, this exception that's included in the, mm -hmm. in the <laughs> title commitment. That's a great question. The best thing you can do is engage with us. Are there additional protections that can be offered over this, right? And sometimes we're gonna tell you no. If, if you don't potentially like an exception on coverage that has to do with an established easement and you want coverage that no one's ever gonna use that easement, we're gonna be like, we can't give that to you, right? Like it's an easement that's established and for use, but we could tell you, you know, something you could do um, that might get rid of it, like approach the easement holder and see if they're willing to terminate it because it's not in use anymore. Um, but then there are other things that like, let's say that you get a survey done and it reveals an encroachment. There might be coverage options for you under which we would provide some layers of coverage for that encroachment. So best thing to do if they have questions is just engage with us and start talking to us about it. We'll tell you what's available and also what the cost of it is. I mean, I've had people say, hey, I'd like coverage over the fact that my fence is like, you know, for me, like we've established that the fence is over the boundary line and I would like coverage over if someone ever forces me to remove that fence. Well, the cost of the endorsement coverage may not be worth the cost to relocate the fence, you know, sort of a thing. So it's a, sometimes a weighing of saying, I, I don't want to take the risk either that I'm paying a couple thousand dollars to move a fence that's clearly over the boundary lines. But I might ask you for, you know, to pay $2,000 for an endorsement coverage over it for me, which might be more than if you had to just move the fence. Um, so it just depends. But we'll weigh those options and talk to them through you about what's available and what the cost is if it ever comes up or your clients. Um, so next is sort of some of the things we talked about are like vesting, right? So the vesting is the owner of the property. That's who we show today has those ownership rights that we discussed. Why is that really impactful and something you should look at? Because you guys get presented at the table with who they tell you owns it, but we're telling you here who actually owns it, who we see a public record. So if Susie executed all your stuff, this might be your first indication, who's Johnny? You know, like, who's that guy? Uh, he didn't sign any of our contracts. And then maybe you find out Johnny's her husband and he's passed away and that's why he wasn't there. And then we have to start looking about what we need to do to clear him. Or we find out it's something that she's like, you know, that's my son. We took him off title a long time ago, but you find out they've been holding this unrecorded deed for, you know, forever. So again, it's just part of, does this person match up to who actually executed my contract and who intends to come to signing with me? Again, a good title company that you're working with, that those are things they should be proactively looking at too and saying, hey, your contract's only with Susie. We've got another person there. What do you know about this other person? Um, but certainly if you're working with someone you're not as familiar with um, or just out of an abundance of caution, it's a good practice to start engaging with your title company if something like that happens sooner rather than later because we don't want to get two weeks away from closing and no one's talked about it, right? Um, legal description. I throw legal description on here not because we would expect that that's something anybody knows. Like, you know, you're not necessarily going to be like, I think that subdivision name is incorrect. But you may, right? So when we find a legal description here, I always tell people to look at it, I think, as a part of a big picture, right? Um, we, we don't know what you're marketing. We only know what you gave us a contract for. And so we've had situations where what was marketed was two sides of a duplex and what was sold was one side. Um, things like that because the address that was put in the contract or the brief legal that somebody put only indicated one side. Um, and so I always think it's good, even though those things might not jump out at you from a legal description standpoint, some of them might. So it's always good to just take a look at that address and that legal and feel like that adds up. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when we're filling out a contract, you know, I, I always double check when an agent gives me um, the description, the legal description, mm -hmm. and I use the tax records. Mm -hmm. Is that the best 
yes. practice. Yep, tax records is the best you can do from a quick standpoint of you know not being a title examiner. Um, you know, you get tax assessor information and their whole purpose is to assess valuation for property and so the property they're saying is encumbered. You know, most assessor, especially in Metro Denver, the tax assessor information that you can pull online is hugely valuable. I mean, they'll tell you how many bedrooms they're assessing, they'll tell you whether it's a multifamily property versus a single family property. You know, they'll sometimes even go into outbuilding descriptions and tell you what's there. So yeah, it's kind of is is this what we think we're selling? You know, also find out building permits whether that should pull one in. You can find out building permits in some (laughs) cases. Some of them are there and some of them are up to date. They're a little bit. They're a tool that we use when we're trying to establish some construction stuff. But we also know that unfortunately, probably about forty percent of people don't pull proper permits when doing work. But it's a tool in our tool belt for sure. Exactly, and you you can call them really helpful as well. Yes, yes. Um, So yeah, those county um, places are a great place to do any sort of double checking, and they're a wealth of knowledge. As you get into sort of outer, more rural areas, they can get less information. But even some of those, you'd be surprised how great some of those are. So, um, so yeah, they're they're a huge part of the research that we do and what we're looking at. But again, the difference for us is we're not comparing that to what was marketed, right? Like what was put up for listing. We don't see MLS. We don't see your advertisements. So. We don't see any of that. We kind of know what was presented to us in a contract, and if we ever feel there's ambiguity between the contract and what we find, then we might call you and ask questions. Um, but if we feel like it's clear, oh, this is what you want to sell, and this is what we found, that's what we're putting on the paperwork, right? Um, so that's really Schedule A. That's you know the meat of it. It's it's what we're agreeing to ensure. So Schedule B one is where we talked about those requirements are laid out, right? So. Um, this is really small up here, but but really what you're going to see is you're always going to see kind of ones up top that look the same on every file. Those are static. Every title company uses some version of them, and they're things that no matter the deal that's closing, we're going to do those things, right? So, you know, the first ones say, you know, paid the agreed amounts for the interest in the land, right? That means if you want me to insure you an owner's policy for 350 grand, buyer's got to actually pay 350 grand to a seller. That needs to happen. Um, pay us the premiums. You have to pay us premium for policy if you want the policy to actually take effect. So um, document satisfactory creating interest. So that's things like deeds and deeds of trust. If you want to have us insure a piece of property, we need you to actually give a deed that goes of record and establishes that ownership right. Um, payments of taxes and charges that are levied against the property. Um, number four is a good one. This lets me zoom in. It does. Um, number four is a good one because I think it's important to talk about um, because we've talked about gaps and we've talked about how there are things we can't know and that's that you have an obligation to tell us about anyone that has an interest in the property that you know about that we don't Um, and I have certainly seen things over the years where people have said let's make a choice to not tell the title company about that so they don't create problems and the piece of advice that I would give you is that Typically, if something turns into a claim later, we will find out that the parties had knowledge and we will deny the claim based on that alone. If you decide to keep information that is material to the insurance policies and interest in the property, your claim will be denied. Um, You have to engage with us, you have to talk about it, and we have to figure out how to navigate it through closing. So it's an important one only because I think sometimes people feel like what we can't see or what we don't know, as long as it's not on here, that they have protection against. And that's not true because one of the standard exclusions in any owner's policy would be a claim that results from knowledge you had that you did not share. So um, big deal there. So even again, like when it comes to reviewing title commitments, it's important to look at vesting. And if someone said, hey, uh, oh, we just took out a HELOC last week that's not showing on here. We need to know about that, right? If it doesn't get paid and we go to closing, we would have to take legal action against the seller for misrepresentation and not informing us. So it's it's great to know that. I'll add to that, too, that like title companies are going to do another search. So this might come out, and then we're going to do another search, like right around the closing. Mm -hmm. And if all of a sudden it pops up right then, cool, this is a fun scramble. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I do think that sometimes it's it's the sellers who are kind of like, oh, I guess they don't know about that. And and so maybe just making sure you're having those conversations with your sellers, like, hey, have you looked at the title commitment? Does everything look right? Do you see anything missing? HOA, right. any loans you have out? 
Because um, if, it, if it pops up right at the last minute and they're like, oh, shoot, you know, like all of a sudden they're not accounting for maybe a $20,000 key lock that maybe they forgot about. Or we could have a 10 day turnaround time on the payoff that we need in order to close. Sure. And yeah. so, you know, that effective date, we update, like um, Becca said, right? Because we might have 45 day window until we actually close. So we'll update those records before we close and try to decrease that gap down to as small as we can. And yeah, we surprise pop up with a HELOC nobody told us about. And then closing is going to get delayed because that particular lender is going to take seven days to get me a payoff figure. You know, we all start to scramble. And so, yeah, the importance of going over this and saying this is the picture that we thought was going to get painted. And even to the point of looking at the dates, um, you could see a line of credit on here that's dated 2017, but your client says they took one out a week ago, this 2017 one's actually already been paid off in a refinance they did and we need a new one, you know, we start sort of running into issues. So it's just great to sort of run through these specific requirements with your folks and say, is this what we thought we were looking at? And let us know about anything we're not. So we've given you some examples here of like what a release of a deed of trust looks like, right? These are those sort of mortgages that are out there against the property. We're going to give you original amounts. We're going to give you the dated dates and when they were recorded. Um, this is an example of what a judgment would look like. So what we talked about, maybe like a credit card debt or any other thing that would get filed for in the courts, typically small claims matters. Um, and these are the sort of things that might be a surprise to your client and they might I mean, I will tell you that even though there's a whole bunch of notifications that come through any sort of court process, uh, the amount of people that are surprised by these when they see them because they didn't know that three credit card companies have filed for judgments and recorded them against their house is, is substantial. Um, and so it's important to go over these and say, do you know about this? And we also sometimes might need information from you, right? So these are the things when we get into the specifics that require information from you. We don't necessarily, we don't have social security numbers, we don't have loan numbers, and we need all that in order to obtain payoffs. So um, sometimes with like judgments and stuff, we can go through like who the creditor is to try to get what we need, but we'll still typically need borrowers authorizations and socials and things of that nature. Um, number 12 is an example of something that you might see that is a survey affidavit or a survey. So that means these are uncommon for most lot and block platted subdivisions. So, and that's because there are certain protections that are afforded to us when we're working within platted subdivisions about, um, and depending on when it was actually subdivided, um, certain things we can rely on about the building being built properly, right? But sometimes we can find out that it's not built properly or we can see evidence of construction. So know that from a title company, you're typically gonna see survey requirements whenever you have something that's new built whenever we see evidence that something is being built or any construction is going on. Your client may have taken money out to remodel the kitchen, but we don't know that they did that. All we see is that they took out some construction financing and we need to figure out if the outside footprint of that building has changed. And so sometimes that survey affidavit is us saying, we just kind of need to know what you're doing. We think you put some improvements in the property and we'd like to know what those are because any sort of, we have mechanics link considerations, right? We have um, considerations when it comes to, did you build a deck on and potentially build that into an easement in your backyard, which would be a problem. So anything that changes outside structures is hugely important to us when it comes to survey protections. Um, and sometimes it's just a question. So this might be a, let's get the conversation going requirement. And it could be that your title company backs off of actually asking for a survey and gets something else once they start talking to you. Or it could be that based on whatever they see and what's disclosed, they're like, we're gonna need a survey. This is probably one of the most common things that I think people fail to recognize soon enough. And so we'll get calls to schedule closings and we'll say, hey, when are we gonna get the ILC that was required? And I will say in a lot of cases for us, we'll even send multiple emails out about it that I think get disregarded because people are not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. And then they'll find out it's gonna take four weeks to get on the surveyor schedule to get out there, just like appraisers right now. So this is important. Um, of course, your contract's going to dictate who's paying for surveys, and, um, and I will tell you, just kind of like we talked about with owner's extended coverage, it's important to remember we are not a party to that contract, so even though buyers and sellers might agree that you don't want a survey as a condition, that doesn't mean we don't want a survey as a condition for protections we're being asked to provide. If you want owner's extended coverage and it involves some survey matter and we see some risk involved that we feel like we need to clear up, we might ask for a survey and it doesn't matter that you bought, you checked the NA box on your contract because we're requiring it. 
So sometimes I think people think, well, you can't because we said we're not going to get one. But those are conditions between buyer and seller about what they want to see, right? When you are requiring something, um, would you always require an ILC or may you also require a more complete survey that could cost $1,700 or something? Great question. So ILCs are what we refer to as drive-by surveys. Depending on the surveyor, yeah, they're – No. I mean, what depends on the surveyor. Some surveyors are – I mean, they nail it on an ILC. They do a great job, and it's, like, really comprehensive. And others – I mean, I've called people and said, hey, this survey shows this. And they're like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really look at it. I just pulled up what was on the county GIS and mapped it. And I'm like, so you can go out there? Bill. Yeah. <laughs> also, in, like, older subdivisions like city and county of Denver, surveyors measure off of monument pins, so pins that were placed a very long time ago, and those pins can move. And so that could mean that every house in the neighborhood is off its boundary by a foot, you know, a, technically according to the monument pins. So there's a lot of components there, but you can tell a good survey product versus a bad one. We can, um, we're used to them. Um, and so sometimes we'll engage with the surveyor once we get it and start asking you know, more questions if that comes up. But to answer your question, for most survey pro like we know that people don't wanna pay huge amounts of money. And so we tend to go for what we think is the minimum required product that we need because we think that's what's gonna make everybody happy. Certainly, if someone wants to go get an improvement survey plat or something like that, we're, we're happy to get anything that's more detailed and more comprehensive. But like you say, typically we, we would expect that we're just going to get tongue lashings if we require something like that. And if we do, then it's, you know, at least my protocol with my staff to say someone better make a phone call, right? Like we don't. Let's not require an Ulta survey, which is going to cost, you know, minimum of maybe $3,000 and not have a conversation about why we're asking for it. Um, plus, sometimes we'll ask to engage with your surveyor. We'll say, let's talk to your surveyor. Let's see what their options are. If we can find an old survey, we can ask to save money by updating an old survey. Um, so there's a lot of ways I think we can try to save money. But there are times when we require those extended surveys, but typically we only see those on high liability or commercial transactions because that's when we actually expect that the buyers want to see those products. And regardless of what we want, they don't want to make an investment of that size without seeing an appropriate survey. And I mean, I'll, I'll get up on a soapbox for a minute. I don't think anyone should buy properties without surveys. I mean, to me, unless you have a survey that was done when the property was built, you know, if you bought a new build and they gave you an ILC when they bought it, so you kind of know where your easements sit at and you know where your house is at, like, I think it's hugely impactful to this piece of property you're buying and worth a couple hundred dollars to see where all your improvements lie and you have all these, you know, what I would call your hopes and dreams about your property and maybe it's to build a 10 foot deck and then you realize this easement sits in the way of your hopes and dreams. I think that's impactful. So I think it's worth the investment, but I know that a lot of people don't want to spend it. So, um, so we tend to pick what we think is gonna cost everybody the least. And if we get one of those bad survey products from like a bad surveyor, we tend to see that and we'll get on the phone with that surveyor and say, hey, we need you to get out of your car. And so get new bills, do you do require a survey on new bills generally? Always new build, build, right? Because we want to see that it is built within the proper building envelopes, the setbacks, that the house is situated where it needs to be. And if you go into Denver and you do a scrape and you tear something down, you put it back up, we're asking for a survey. But I will tell you that almost every city and county building department is also going to require that. And they want to know you built it where you were supposed to build it and that it matches up to the plans that you submitted with your permits. So usually we're just asking for a copy of what you already had to do anyways when it comes to new build. Um, but sometimes we can get a transaction where we're maybe like doing permanent financing on a home a year and a half after it was built and then no one can find this survey that was done. and. So um, that's the only time typically where we'd ask for a new one, but usually they have to get it for the city, you know, building purposes anyways, so. Do you get many instances where, say you've got a home that's, I don't know, it's on its third owner, and when it was originally bought on the survey, there were no fences around the property, mm -hmm. and then it's got three owners later, and they come in and buy it, and yeah. they don't get a survey, and then they decide, oh, I'm just going to do a survey in my house, and they find that the fence is 
way over. Yeah, most, most common survey issue is fence say, doesn't okay. line up to boundary So line. what's the repercussions of that? How, th is that something I mean, you guys cover? Or no. Or is this, is this something that... No, I mean, we're going to... One, if we knew it, we would disclose it and exclude it from coverage, right? So it's if we know. So if there's a survey product provided to us and we see it, but otherwise we might not know. Now, aerial imaging could show us something like that and we could say, hey, that fence looks off, but usually aerial imaging and the county maps are... You know they're not exact your fence might be off by six inches and we're not gonna see that on like an aerial photo um, but let's say it does get disclosed to us we typically don't give owners coverage over stuff like that we're kind of like if you don't like where the fence is at you've got to move it you need to look at that as a cost of buying that property and what you're getting um, the concern in putting your fences in the wrong spot and sometimes people do this they actually choose to do it right yeah. like I'm one of those people. I bet I built my fence about six inches in on my property line, specifically so that I would make sure I was not extending beyond my property line. But what that kind of creates is an issue where technically my neighbors are possessing six inches of property they yeah. don't own, right? Yeah. But it's one of those things that I guess I just know because I'm in the business, nobody cares about six inches. Like we're not fighting over it, you know? I mean, what we fight about is things like you move your fence two feet off the property line and the concern comes into play for us and a claims risk comes into play for us where we think that neighbor might come knocking on your door someday or you might go knocking on the neighbors and say i want these two feet these two yeah. feet are valuable to me and but we would say to you that that's part of an evaluation process when you're purchasing what do you want to do with those two feet? You could go to the neighbor and establish agreement, which allows you to use those two feet and keep everything where it is and make it all good of public record, saying you've agreed to this discrepancy in your boundaries, right? The second is that you could decide to make the investment to move the fence and talk to that neighbor about it before you purchase. But it's not something that we would cover. We're not gonna say, pay us a couple hundred dollars and when it becomes an issue, we're gonna pay $2,000 to relocate the fence. That wouldn't be a smart business decision for us. So it would be your cost, the person buying the property, to move the fence if I they don't like the fence. Well, I, your neighbor's going to say, I'm not paying for that. Well, right. I mean, I would. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I like would tell you money. that lots of neighbors, depending on it, will. It all depends. So, I mean, I think that it depends on whether you're going over or you're on the other side, right? right? So. I also think that it's a seller negotiation thing, right? Seller may realize that every buyer is going to take issue with this, and it's something they need to remedy, um, or but they may not. Is it also a bit like an easement if it's been there for such a long time? Uh, what what is the statute there are, of limitations like? Well, you can't get moved because it's been there over ten years. Well, there are so there are some components which can allow you to take possession, which we call adverse possession. Um, saying that if you've used something for a certain period of time, there are some laws to say you get it. However, I always caveat that because some people be like, well, if you've used it for 20 years, you get it. And I'm like, you get it if a court says you get it. <laughs> so you have to go to court, you have yeah. to prove certain components of adverse possession, which are things like open and conspicuous use for 20 years. You have to show that there's a dispute over it. You know, you have to sort of hit these components and get a judge to agree to say, yeah, that's good, and hope that that doesn't ensue in a fight between you and someone else that goes on for a year. So I say, yes, you have some protections when you've been using something like that for a long time, but it doesn't make it so of public record. There are then steps you need to take in order to make it so and really put it into play that you have that. And so again there, that's an investment that someone would have to say, if it ever becomes a problem, I'm okay to make that investment. And I think that's really the justification most people go through and we're kind of like, it's off. We're like, how material is it to you that it's that you would walk away from this house over it? Or does it become a sales price negotiation tactic? Like, hey, a person might have to pay $1,000 in order to fix this problem a year from now if it ever came up with the seller, so we want that off the sales price, you know what I mean? A lot of ways to skin that cat, so to speak. I think, but if we know about it, we'll disclose it. But we likely wouldn't offer coverage over it. So if I'm a buyer's broker and I'm going through the title, I, I get the title and reviewing it, and then I see judgments, liens, everything, you know, all the stuff you don't want as seller on mm -hmm. there. Do I immediately ring up the seller's agent and say, Hey, listen, have you seen the title? Have you like gone through this and what are the status of all these liens and judgments? I think it's probably okay that you assume, and I mean, I, I'm not in your guys' you know, position in doing your job, so I might not have the best experience to answer that, but I guess if I was, I would say, I think it's okay to assume that listing agent is doing their job and engaging in that conversation okay. with their seller. 
Um, and I also think that typically the title company is going to help inform you if they feel like things aren't moving in the right direction. But it certainly doesn't hurt. You know, I mean, it never hurts to reach out, I think, to a listing agent and say, hey, just saw all this stuff there. I want to make sure you're on it and you saw it too. I don't think that hurts. I guess that depends on how the receiving party is going to take yeah. that, you know. Yeah. I don't know, but yes. Uh, there are a couple of us in the room that probably realize that we never assume anything. Yeah, I don't think it hurts. Yeah, so. you know, just to cover mm -hmm. my butt. Yeah, and hopefully that listing agent, because we have one of these to show oh, really? up. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but we had one on our own listing, and I got the title work, and you know, it normally just goes off to the buyer, and I wasn't too worried about it. And I looked at it, I thought, oh, I better check it out. It's a $60,000 tax lien. Mm -hmm. Yay. So we called up our seller, our friend, <laughs> and said, hey, uh, I'm going to send this title thing over to you. You need to look at this section. It says you have a $60,000 tax lien. I don't. <laughs> Says you have a sixty thousand dollar tax lien. Don't know if you have one. Don't have any clue if you have one. However, because it's in the title paperwork, the buyers are going to be seeing this, and somebody needs to make it go away. And so I put him in touch with title, and they they did take care of it. To this day, I do not know if that was a legitimate mm -hmm. debt. Or mm -hmm. if the, it was social. paid, or if it didn't belong to them, I never heard another word. But I do know that the revised title work came out, and it wasn't on there anymore. So well, and that's where I would say, like, to answer your question, I don't think it's necessarily that you're completely riding the risk that someone else can take care of it. Because I also think that's part of our job, right? Like, we're calling and saying hey, what are we going to do about this tax lien? <laughs> but, but yes, I mean, you, I think there's a, when you're somewhere where you know the people you're working with and maybe you know what your title company is going to do, even checking with your title company and saying, hey, I just want to make sure you guys are on this, never hurts either, you know. Um, certainly everybody's human in the process and it never hurts to check and, and see. I wouldn't necessarily think that, you know, I mean, I think that if there's a lot of debts attached to a property, I think that, Typically, some some math can tell you whether there's potentially a big problem there, right? So you can sort of look at it and say, do these are these things contemplated in the sales price, or does a sixty thousand dollar lien throw me over this person making any money and might kill this deal? Those I think are great conversations to have versus a bunch of little judgments that might be easily cleared up. You know, if you see stuff about mechanics liens. If you know work's going on and you see a mechanics lien, I think that's a red flag to, are you paying your contractors? What's going on? You know, I mean, um, I think that, you know, to the extent that you want to try to make sure that someone's not walking away from a property and leaving you in a situation where some sub is going to come knocking on the door of your purchasers two weeks after they close and being like, hey, I didn't get paid for this job and I see you bought it. And then they, of course, get really scared about all that. And, but don't um, mechanics liens have to be filed within 30 days? They have to be filed within four months of completion of work. Four months. Right. So they fall off after a certain amount of time as well, don't they? they, they technically, there are, there are a lot of laws surrounding mechanics liens. And I will tell you that the title company standard is after 13 months, we stop caring about them. Um, once they're of record. So 13 months is a long time. Technically, under the law, they've got four months after they complete work to file a lien. Um, and then remember that when they complete work might be subject to a lot of people's opinions. And so that might be something that has to be vetted out in court. But technically, once they actually file notice of the lien and put the world on notice, they're supposed to take steps to start foreclosure action within six months from that time. So title companies rely on a 13-month rule because it makes us yeah. feel good that we are well beyond those periods. Okay, in regards to that, I had a listing that before I went, ever even took the listing, I had another title company, not you, um, do an O&E and search a particular lien that mm -hmm. we knew was a mechanics lien that was attached from the builder when these properties were built. Mm -hmm. And this title company came back and said, nope, it's a, it's a mechanics lien, they fall off after 13 months, nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Great. We list the property, we go into contract, um, title pulls up, it's almost $5,000. Mm -hmm. And my client had to pay it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just did. They said, nope, sorry, we were wrong. You know, I mean, I went back and forth with title because I'm like, 
I sent you the specifics. I sent this to you. But had we known, we would just know and say, hey, you're going to have to pay $5,000. Right. Everybody has to pay it the first time they sell it. Like every mm -hmm. first owner had to pay this off. Mm -hmm. But from it was, the, it from, was the original from, from the original builder. Oh, we're not talking about like a private transfer fee? Under, no, it was... It was a mechanics lien, something, the builder had gone belly up and somebody Strange. didn't get paid. Yeah. But um, this title company, I mean, we went rounds because I'm like, not only did I send this direct to you, here mm -hmm. it is. And then you specifically, here's your here's your wording, 13 months, it falls off. I right. sent that to my, my seller. Yeah. And now she's looking at $5,000 less that she's going to get. I can tell you that the only time I would ever make that distinction, I would feel 100% comfortable saying 13 months and it's gone and I wouldn't change my mind about it unless I had some knowledge that someone was going to actively litigate that. And I don't want to buy into active litigation, right? So if I'm like 13 months, 6 months, 4 months, whatever it is, someone's taking this to court and actively fighting over it. If we go back to my duty to defend, I'm not willing as an insurance company to throw my defense dollars in that fight necessarily, right? So sometimes disputes come down to all the stars can align from an underwriting perspective, but you know people are arguing over it and they're litigious and you don't know where that's gonna go. And so you have to do what protects you know you and the insured in the end, which is say, you know, stop. That's the only thing I think that would change my mind in that particular, that I would say like, well, I'm not adhering to the 13 month rule, um, but I mean, I just never was, say I never. Guess, you know, I mean, I haven't used that title company since because I, I obviously walked away pretty angry with them. Right. Like, I sent you all of this information. Right. And oh, well, sorry. Yeah. Wait, sorry, I can't we were say wrong. why. Yeah, they might okay, make that yeah. choice. But I will point out the fact that I think that what you did there in requesting an O&E and pointing out what you were looking at is really really impactful to a title company and I would say is like phenomenal and everybody should do that mm -hmm. we get a lot of requests for O and E's and you should know that O and E products are you're getting a whole different thing from different title companies that you order them for right Can you're you getting, go into that a little bit sure like when we should order those mm -hmm. well I don't I mean I know some people have like a process of doing it every time they list a property or whatever it is I don't I don't necessarily know you know from that standpoint I don't think I can suggest to you when it might be a good time because I'm not familiar enough about what you guys do or where that might be impactful but where we see a lot of agents order them is when they're going to listing so I think they want to feel prepared to get a listing and so they want to know who does title show owns the property what sort of liens show up out there so that they're having good proactive conversations with seller about that right out of the gates um, the problem with some of that is that I think that O&E products are really different depending on where you order them from. Some are really comprehensive and they're going to give you all liens that affect a property and some are going to give you very limited liens. So some are going to give you property specific liens like deeds of trust but not give you judgments because judgments are not property specific liens. You know, O&Es are $5 and most people want them in the space of a couple hours. And that means we can't put this level of work product into an O&E. We can't even put the same skill level on it. And that's me just me being like real with everyone in this room about O&E products. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's always a challenge for us when we feel like they're not comprehensive or they don't give people a picture of what they really want to see because we're like $5 products on two hours or there's limited resources on that. Right. So when you really want a comprehensive picture, like maybe you have an estate issue or probate and you like or someone's talked to you about a whole bunch of liens and you're like, you know, I really want to know what I'm looking at. Order a preliminary title commit commitment, you know, like get the get the whole shebang. It's going to take a couple days, but it'll be worth it. Um, but if you really just want to see kind of generally speaking, who's in ownership to a property, what sort of liens are out there and get a little bit of a picture, um, then ordering an O&E is great. It can give you something quickly. Um, I would say when you know you're looking for something specific and you have questions about it, you need to ask those questions, right? O&Es don't include bankruptcy searches. I'll get O&E requests all the time. People will say, well, we want to know if this bankruptcy, you know, affected this property. And we're like, we don't do BK searches as part of O&Es. Like, that's not a component that even comes into play for an O&E. Um, so, like I say, so, like we as a practice include non-specific property liens, so we include judgments, but I know five other title companies that don't. Um, so that's what I mean, depending on where you're ordering from, you're going to get different types of products. So the great thing to do is ask your title company what you're getting for your $5. That's what most of us charge, and you're going to get sort of a, 
you know, what's included here and what's included there. But if you're looking at something specific because you have a question, the very best thing you can do is ask us about that specific thing. Don't ride the risk that we'll find it or we won't. <laughs> Just tell us about it and tell us what your question is. Um, that's sometimes where we get stuck because someone will say, we were hoping, we wanted to see if this would come up on the O&E, but it didn't. And we're like, well, it was outside the scope of an actual O&E search, and that's why it didn't. But we didn't know you were looking for it. Otherwise, we would have pulled it up specifically and addressed your questions. So do bankruptcies generally come up in a regular title commitment? I don't think I've ever seen one. Well, we definitely do a bankruptcy search, right? Because if you're in bankruptcy, that potentially affects your ability to sell a property. The bankruptcy court now has rights to all of your assets. And so, yeah, as part of some of those databases we look at, BK is, is part of that for sure. And in some cases, we can have liens, like if we talk about liens that are still out there of record that people think are cleared, they can go through bankruptcy proceedings and think that they addressed a lien in a BK and that they don't have to pay it off. And so maybe it's not a lien they told you about. Um, but, um, you know, I guess the best way I always tell people this is the bankruptcy court addresses your personal obligation to pay. If you have a lien against a property, a lien that is secured against real property, like a deed of trust, you have to go through specific actions to void that lien in bankruptcy proceeding. Just because you included it on your debts doesn't mean it got wiped out by your BK. It still is collateralized against your property, even if you do not have a personal obligation to pay that anymore, because it's now secured against your property. So you can void it, and a lot of times we have to get backup paperwork, but we might find a deed of trust and your people will say, no, we handled that as part of a BK you know, many years ago. And then we would go through the process of saying, did your BK attorney actually handle that when it came to the real property records sort of a thing? So, so I had a situation in my last closing and it was kind of confusing because I was representing the buyer and probably about five or six years ago they had gone through bankruptcy mm -hmm. and it appeared later that their attorney maybe was a little sloppy with the work but when we came back with the title commitment it listed this judgment on the buyer and of course the lender already knew about the bankruptcy and all that mm -hmm. but because it was listed it put them into a tailspin so mm -hmm. why would I guess the question is if if the title insurance is to protect the buyer to ensure that the seller can right. convey why are they checking on the buyer because if your buyer was getting a loan, that could affect the lender's <coughs> lien position if there's a debt against the buyer that like, okay. so for example, let's say there's a recorded transcript of judgment out there, but your buyer doesn't own any property. The minute they come in to title on a property, bam, that attaches, right? So like one thing, like even people that will quick claim deed within their families, they don't think about maybe some of those debts and then all of a sudden they attach all these debts because these people had debts out there recorded against them. There are some laws that I will tell you that protect a lender against something like that jumping up in front of a lender's lien position. So you'll find that there's different protocols within title companies for how they handle buyer searches. You're buying a piece of property. If you're, if you're cash, nobody cares because again, that exclusion is like any act of the insured is denied. If you can't make a claim against me because a judgment creditor tried to foreclose a house when the judgment is against you, you know, like you have to pay that if you want to clear it. Um, if you have a lender, then we start questioning lien position and we say, well, how does that lien affect once this person comes into title? There are protections out there for a purchase money mortgage. And if I tried to sort of walk that out for everyone, it would be that if I'm buying a piece of property and I have a judgment against me and I need a lender to loan me money to buy it, the law basically says that as soon as I come into title, even though the judgment might be recorded a year before I got title, Basically, my purchase money mortgage comes in as first lien and that judgment goes <coughs> behind it. Because it says, if for not this loan, Nikki could not have purchased this, meaning this could not have attached. Now, once I refi this loan, that's a whole other story. Now this guy pops up in front, right? But when it's purchase money funds, it says, you can't jump up in front of the purchase money funds. If not for those funds, you'd have nothing to attach to in the first place. So there are some laws that protect against that. So you'll find some title companies don't search buyers at all. They're like, yeah. as long as I've got a first purchase money mortgage or it's cash, I don't care about any of that. But I will tell you that we're one of the companies that we do buyer searches. And it's because we've actually gotten calls from buyers after the fact 
that are angry at us because when they went to refi or sell, it then affected them and they feel like it was our duty to disclose that that was going to affect their property. So what we do is we'll do that buyer search. We'll typically show things on the title commitment and then we'll kind of engage in conversation. If it's causing someone a problem, then we're kind of like, we can remove it, but you know, you know that um, you know, like it is going to affect your property. Kind of engage in that conversation so we don't get the anger call down the road. And then we have like a general exclusion that just sort of says that like any one of those things that would affect a purchaser, you know, are going to affect you that we do as kind of a disclaimer. But again, there's there's different protocols for different companies on how they handle that. But usually if it does come up because of some of those laws I just talked to you about, you can get a title company to remove it. But they might be doing it out of an abundance of caution because sometimes um, when we decide, oh, it doesn't matter, people can still get upset with us after the fact because they think it mattered to them. And even though we didn't know it would. So. Well, and, and in this case, this had been filed actually a year before the bankruptcy. And the paperwork mm -hmm. showed that it was addressed in the bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. But apparently, I guess the lawyer may not have done all the work. Right. And and so then the problem was, if you open the file back up to try to address it, the clock starts again. Yep. And you they couldn't buy. And yep. so, it, you know, ultimately it got resolved, but it pushed out closing by two weeks. And, I, and I would challenge your title company on that and say. Well, that's I mean, it was a, a seller's title company. So what, yeah, I mean, but yeah. I mean, still, you're a paying consumer, right? Yeah. Like you're out there paying for products too and paying for closing services. Because of some of those laws, I would say, you know, you can challenge your title company and so, you know. We, you know, we always say here, we get that not every deal you do is going to be with us. And so to the extent that we can help you navigate an issue that's at a different title company, call us because we might be able to say, hey, you know, like that title company just may not really know what they're doing. And there are some laws out there to protect them. They can remove this judgment. They can move on with their life. Like, and here's what it is and, and help you out. So call us if you feel like you're in situations like that. Because there is title companies that, you know, we, I, I don't know, there are definitely some that are just not necessarily abreast of all those laws and those protections. So, especially if you're working sometimes with like a client who's like national and not local, which sometimes happens, you know. Um, okay, so I want to get into, last time I specified too in regards to O&Es and title commitments. So it wasn't the like she said, if there's an O&E and you know what in particular you're looking for, like maybe you know there's a foreclosure, let us know. If you have a listing agreement and you know that there's some wonky things going on, say, Becca, here's the listing agreement, can we just do a TBD title commitment? And that way we can look and clear some things up before you have a buyer. Right. And that way they're not looking at, like you said, like the buyer is like, well, why is there a $60,000 <coughs> tax lien? Well, if, if your sellers knew about that in the first place, we could have did a TBD title commitment cleared it up so the buyer never saw anything like that. So just keep me yeah. posted on kind of what you're walking into and we can either get an O&E that's more detailed or we can do a full on title commitment. We just need a listing agreement to know you actually have the right to list this property for them. What's the cost of that? Um, how do you like to say that? Well, a TBD commitment costs $115, but if you get to an insured product, that cost gets waived. So it is something that you have to look at as a cost of either if there's something you want to dig into and you want to do your due diligence up front, and then it never goes under contract, we're gonna invoice you for that TBD at $115. But it goes under contract. It goes under contract, mm -hmm. it's part of the title premium gotcha. because we did that work preliminarily sure. that we would have done for the insurance anyways. Okay, so, sure. yep. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for it unless you're like, I already have a listing agreement, we're good to go here, let's get things moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So exceptions I wanna get into because I think they're really impactful. So where we talk about requirements, I think those are really impactful conversations with sellers. I think exceptions are really impactful conversations with buyers. And I'm gonna talk about something that I'm really, really passionate about here and that's that I think that we have an obligation to purchasers to at the bare minimum say, read this, right? And I think that I'm always surprised by the sheer volume of people that I think when they are asked by their clients, what is this title commitment? The answer is kind of like, oh, it's nothing. It's just like standard documents you get or whatever it is. It is not, you, I think, have to tell people that these are the things that their property comes subject to that don't tend to be clear, right? And for me at the title company, I don't know what all their hopes and dreams are and all the plans for their property. I don't know if they're gonna paint the house purple, if they wanna put up a chicken coop in the backyard, if they wanna put a pool in. Um, you know, I don't know any of those things and you might know some of them, you might not, you may not know them either. And so 
I don't think it's anyone's responsibility to necessarily point all these individual things out and say, are you okay with that? I think the responsibility is to tell people these things are impactful to your use and enjoyment and ability to sell this property. And you have a responsibility to look at them and know what they are. And I want to acknowledge that I get that that is walking a tightrope and tricky because you're asking people to read documents that they don't totally understand and are not written in layman's terms. And some of them are really old and hard to read. And I get all that. But I still think no matter what, it is a best practice to have informed customers that feel like they know what they were getting and had an opportunity to ask questions. So when it comes to buyers, you know, again, you're always going to have kind of standard exceptions from coverage and kind of a whole other conversation, and I know we're running over, but really kind of one through five are standard exceptions. One through four are going to get insurance coverage when you get OEC. So if anyone wants to talk more about OEC after this class, we can definitely dive into that. But I'm, I'm really talking about the specific exceptions, the covenants, the easements, the agreements. Um, all of those things are really impactful. And so let me bring up a few situations. We had a buyer one time on a property that happened to be a friend of the title company. So someone we knew who bought a really large lot in the city and county of Denver, which is very hard to come by. And they were very excited about it because of their hopes and dreams about putting a big pool in the backyard. Only because we knew them and they were a friend to us did we know about that. And so when we did the title search, we saw there was a 30-foot right-of-way in this huge backyard to the city and county of Denver that had existed for many years. So we said, hey, we know you really want this property because you want to put a pool in there. But this right-of-way is here. Clearly no one's using it. No one's driving through the backyard. But it's there. It affects the property and it's never been extinguished. So you might want to engage with the city about getting that revoked. Um, and the process was so lengthy and costly for them to do that, they decided not to buy the property. Had I never had the discussion with them about the fact that they wanted a pool in the backyard, I wouldn't have been able to say heads up. <laughs> but what I could say was, I don't know what you want to do with the property. So I suggest you read all these and you look at them and you understand what they are. And I'm going to say, we are happy to help navigate the questions that they have. Okay. I can't give them legal advice just like you guys can't. I can't when they say, should I be okay with this? I can't tell them what they should or shouldn't be okay with, but I can help them understand what the document is and its effect on the property. Um, and people shy away from that because they don't want to give other people advice, but I'm going to say, we're happy to help in that regard. So engage with us and we'll help. Um, if someone's like, I just don't even understand what this means. And we may say in some cases, this particular easement is really non-specific. We have no idea what it means. It was established 50 years ago. We don't know where it lies. We don't know when it ends. We don't, we don't know any of that. You know what we know. What we know is recorded was agreement between the parties. And then again, you know, people kind of have to decide. So I get that telling people to look at those things can make them uncomfortable and cause tough situations. But I personally think it's worse when you have people who don't know what they're buying and don't know how it's going to affect and, and they can feel misrepresented down the road. So that's kind of my thing about exceptions is really impactful the buyers to say even nothing other than make sure you read all of those and you look at them. You should be getting a hyperlinked commitment from most companies. Some still don't hyperlink and you'll get them in the form of large amounts of PDFs, but the documents should be looked at and reviewed. You know, um, and I want to talk about a few of those. So um, no, first off, commitment versus policy. Commitment is our promise to issue a policy. You're probably going to get a call a couple months after closing that says, what's this thing I just got? That's the ultimate binder of the policy in our terms. But the commitment is our commitment to issue it so sellers can put their money with us and buyers can put their money with us and put documents with us and rely on the fact that we're going to issue the coverages that we said we were going to issue. If I actually never issue my policy, as long as you relied on my commitment within the appropriate time frames and we satisfied the requirements, it doesn't matter if I never issue you policy. You have coverage. I can't, as in, in, it's a protection to say I can't as an insurer be like, well, you're not covered because I never actually issued you a policy, right? So you can rely on the commitment. Um, so this is kind of what we already talked about. There are some slides here about how you assist your clients when it comes to their review of the title commitment. So, you know, again, some of these are written like scripts a bit, but, um, you know, you're basically telling buyers to look at those exceptions, drill down on those, make sure that they're getting, you know, what they're good with and let us know if there's questions about it. With sellers, go through requirements, make sure we're all on the same page with what needs to be paid off and what needs to be cleared from title. 
Um, and then kind of the same thing we talked about, tricky situation there we know about telling people to read stuff and then once they start reading it, all the questions that they have, but will help. Um, and then we kind of go into some, you know, escrow agent responsibilities, kind of what we're doing from a closing perspective and our neutrality and that that's the benefit of our role here, right? So even though sometimes people don't always want us to be neutral, um, it's important that we remain neutral because everyone deposits documents, instructions, and money with us, and it's important that we don't release any of those unless we make sure everyone's getting what they thought they were getting. Um, so even sometimes when you may not like that we're sitting on the fence about something or not taking a side, there's, there's purpose behind that and that we want to make sure we're protecting all the consumers that are involved. Um, and of course our, our expertise there, um, we're doing you know, thousands of these in any given month which allow us a level of expertise that's just different than someone maybe doing a handful in their lifetime. And then of course we go through auditing and regulatory components to make sure that you know we're doing what we need to do to protect people and that we're issuing the products that we say we're going to issue. Um, that's kind of this is a little bit more so and again some of this is written so that you can refer back to it later so if you're if your clients do not understand what is the role of a title agent and an escrow agent this is a ton of information that you could give them about why you're paying for an escrow agent and why you're using them right so it talks about sort of what we do once we get your contracts and all that title research and what we do from an escrow standpoint um, sorry I'm breezing through these because we're short on time um, the last thing is I can't I can't get in a room full of realtors and feel good about not talking about cyber fraud. <laughs> um, and I, and I, yeah, I think that it's such a huge issue that these are a lot of steps here that we've given you as guidance of what you can do to help protect against that. But the biggest, biggest thing is tell your customers to be on the lookout. You know, I mean, I think sometimes when they don't have any idea that engaging in a real estate transaction kind of puts them a target on their back for these people. Um, that are you know really acting as predators and trying to get their money I think just telling them to be cautious and making them aware is 75% of the battle um, so these are kind of some steps that we think you and them can take when it comes to helping them navigate that um, and then because we're a table funding state here or a wet funding state it talks about how there's all sorts of things that we do after closing once everybody leaves and that's kind of it we kind of go through recording documents, paying everybody, um, you know, getting everything sort of tied up, doing reporting to the state and the IRS for proceeds and issuing out those final insurance policies. Um, so I know we did a lot of Q&A other than that. Um, does anybody else have any other questions about anything? If I have a question, I want to ask this title company, I'll contact you. Yeah. You know how that works? Yeah. yeah? And okay. if, if, so my role in the company is I'm kind of like the, the connector. So I connect you to the closing team, I'm going to get answers from Nikki or somebody else. Maybe. Um, but if you have a question, you know me, you need a title quote, you need marketing, I'm your gal, and I'll get you the answers from there. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Nikki. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good. And we'd love to have you at our closing table, but in the meantime, please consider me a resource. Um, and let me know how we can help you out. I hope this kind of sends you off confidently to read through tell commitments with your clients. And um, I got all of your emails, so I'm going to send you this presentation and also a document on reading through a title commitment, which I think is great. Like Nikki's saying, is you don't need to like send somebody the title commitment and say like, yep, yeah, it looks good, everything looks fine. But say, hey, here's the title commitment. Here's some information on how to read through it. Contact me if you have questions, and then you can always just connect them to us. I do have your email. Yeah. 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 Yeah.